going. You're leaving? Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm live. This is my technical help here. That's <laughs> Zoe, my daughter. Allie's riding away on a scooter in the house. My scooter ten, in the house. My 10-year-old. in the house. My 10-year-old is upstairs. Uh, she says she's going to troll me live, so I'll be watching the comments from her. Hey, thanks, everybody, for coming. Sorry it took me a second to get on line here. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh-oh, here she comes. Uh, the whole family wants to say hello. If it's like your family, we're all in the house today, 24-7. Uh, this is Micah. So go ahead and say hi, Micah, and then I got to get started. Hiss. All right. She's a cat right now. That's fine. Hey. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is... Sorry, I had to, okay, I think we'll be okay now. <laughs> if you're also uh, under quarantine, you uh, may be having some similar issues. Uh, here we go. My name is Matt Michelotis. I'm the author of 10 books in the last 10 years, 11 years. Uh, I've got six more under contract. I've also written for a variety of magazines, including uh, today.com, part of uh, the Today Show. Uh, I've written for Writer's Digest. I've written for Nature Magazine, a bunch of science fiction magazines like uh, uh, an anthology. I love the Unidentified Funny Objects. Uh, and uh, boy, there's just a bunch. I, you can see them all on my website if you like. So, oh, and I'm doing a bi-weekly article on tor.com. That's T-O-R.com about the... Uh, the works of C.S. Lewis, the fantasy and science fiction works of C.S. Lewis. So I've been published a good amount, and I get asked all the time by people who send me notes about how to get published. So and that's what we're talking about today. So let me give you a brief overview of what we're going to cover. And if you have questions and things along the way, please feel free to send them. I'm watching the live chat, and I'll do my best to answer those questions. So what we're going to walk through today, one, some myths you probably have heard or have felt or possibly believe about publishing. We're going to talk about the three things that every publisher wants in a book. If you have these three things, I guarantee you they will buy your book. And then we're going to talk about how to write a proposal, which is basically your business uh, suggestion to a publisher of why they should publish your book. We'll talk about agents, whether to get one. The answer is, I think you should. Uh, and then how to get one. Talk a little bit about conferences, some of the practical steps of fiction and nonfiction writing, and, and well, of uh, getting your book published anyway. And then just a little bit about rejection, uh, which I know you probably already feel like you know plenty about that, but we'll talk a little more about it, how to use it as a tool, and then I'll share a little bit about my own publishing story just as an example. So here we go. And again, if you have questions as I'm talking, feel free to put them in the live chat, or if you have questions you want to make sure that I address before I get to the end, same thing. Glad to uh, interact and answer questions as we go along. So let's talk about three myths, first of all, that I hear oftentimes from people who aren't yet published, uh, often but want to be, maybe are frustrated. The first one I hear with some regularity is that editors or agents or someone in publishing hates you the uh, author and is doing everything they can. I, I never call her a dream crusher because I, I don't want her to hurt me. Uh, the, the, the basic idea here is that agents and editors are gatekeepers who want you to fail, but that's not true. And I know a bunch of agents, I know a bunch of editors, and none of them uh, want you to fail. They all want you to be successful because one, they love books, they love writing, and two, this is their livelihood. It's how they make money. So they desperately, I talk to editors all the time. I talk to agents all the time who tell me they would love to open up their email and have it be an email from you that is presenting a book that they want. They would be thrilled. So they're not out to stop you. They are rooting for you. They want you to be successful. What might sometimes make it feel this way is they're also very busy people. And if you haven't done your basic research of how to write questions that could be answered from a Google search, let's say, 
they're, they don't have time to train you in those mm-hmm. things uh, unless they already have, you know, an expectation that your book is something they're interested in, or if they have personal relationship, things like that. So that's the first myth that editors hate you. They don't, or agents, they don't. Uh, the second one I hear all the time is that it's impossible to break in, that publishing's gotten harder and harder. There are fewer and fewer slots. There's less and less money, less and less shelf space, uh, and it's impossible to break in, but that's not true. It just isn't. Uh, obviously, I broke in just a little, just about 11 years ago, uh, and people break in every year. There's new authors every single year, and there's no reason that one of them couldn't be you. Uh, oftentimes I hear this from people who are frustrated because they've been trying and they've failed so far. And that doesn't mean you're never going to make it. And a big part in any artistic community of being a professional is being someone who doesn't give up and keeps going. Uh, that's true writing. It's true in acting, dancing, any number of different artistic endeavors. If you keep going, keep growing in your skills, there is a space for you. Uh, and I believe that's true in publishing too. And I have friends, most of the uh, many friends who have made it a goal to get published and and they have, which is amazing. So that can be true for you too. Uh, The third one, and this is maybe a more disappointing myth to destroy, is the one that says, once I get published, I'm going to be rich. Which maybe, maybe you are, it's possible, uh, but it's not super common. And there are authors who you know and love, that you know their names, who are uh, consistently putting out books and they have day jobs. A lot of authors I love have day jobs. I have a day job. Uh, And that's with a book a year for the last 10 years. So most likely you're not going to be rich. It could be. It happens. But that's uh, if your goal is to get to the place that you're rich, um, again, it doesn't mean you can't but just setting some expectations of the myths. So so there's some myths. Let's talk about three things every publisher wants. When you're coming and pitching your book, what are they looking for? Well, remember that publishing is a business, especially when we're talking about traditional publishing. Uh, And actually, my friends who are in independent publishing will tend at least. So there's three things every publisher is looking for. Uh Uh-oh, saying my connection is unstable. Hopefully you didn't lose me there. Three things every publisher is looking for. If you have these three things, a publisher will buy your book. Maybe not every publisher is going to want it, but a publisher will want it. And those three things are these. Uh, Number one, the amazing idea. This is what most of us are like. I have this incredible idea that's going to sell a million books. Great. They want They want the uh, incredible idea of a book that's going to sell a million copies. Uh, The second thing is professionalism. They want to know. The second thing is that they want professionalism. Uh, Professionalism is a variety of things, right? That can be uh, if they make a deal with you, are you going to turn your manuscript in on time? Are you going to be fun to work with or easy to work with or at least professional to work with? Uh, And your skills may fall in here too. Do you have the skills necessary? Are you a good writer? Are you a strong writer? Uh, Are you a beautiful writer? Uh, That's all part of professionalism. And then the third thing, the thing you've heard all the time and that many aspiring writers tell me is the most discouraging is platform. Platform is uh, what is your reach? How many people can you sell the book to personally? Now, we're going to talk a little bit about platform just because that's the one people get the most worried about and upset about because they're like, I don't know how to get a million followers on Twitter. Well, well, neither do I. (laughs) So let's talk about that. Uh, But first, let me say this. These three things, if you have all three of them, you have an incredible idea. It's on time. Everything's going to be fine. You know, uh, and three, that uh, you have a big platform. They're going to want your book. But let's say you only have two. Well, that might be okay, actually. Uh, If you have to take a pretty strong look at you, because To be honest, many authors don't have all three of these things. For instance, I know a decent number of authors who have really, really great ideas, really beautiful writing, and they're fun to work with, and they get book deals all the time. Uh, Now, they have some sort of platform usually, but not an amazing platform necessarily. 
Uh, or if you have one of these things and it's just astonishingly good, that can get you a deal too. So for instance, let's take uh, Taylor Swift, right? She has a platform that is enormous. And uh, knowing Taylor Swift, she's probably a really excellent writer too. And we know she's a professional, but let's just imagine that all she had was her platform, like millions of followers, uh, diehard fans. And uh, Taylor Swift comes to a publisher and says, I'd like to do a book on any topic she wants. Um, Regency era furniture and clothing. They'd be like, Taylor Swift, yes, of course you can do that. And that's why we often get books by celebrities on you know weird topics. So I remember Madonna, uh, who at the time her brand was really about um, you know, pop music in a very specific uh, way of selling it. And then she was like, I want to do children's books. And of course, a publisher took that because she has a, a, a gigantic platform. Now, let's imagine that you don't have a big platform, but you have an incredible idea, uh, like a really obvious, like you say it and everyone says, whoa, clearly that's going to sell. Like it's just one sentence. And they're like, amazing. Yes, we'll buy that book. Uh, that could happen. It does happen. So you have all three of these. Amazing. If you only have one, it better be the most astonishing one. That, so uh, let's take professionalism. You know, a lot of ghost writers, what they have is really, really strong professionalism. They may have zero platform. Uh, they may have no ideas of their own. It could be. Uh, but what they do is they are their work people who come in and they get the job done. So they're like, uh, boy, I don't know if you read Trevor Noah's book, which was astonishingly good. If Trevor Noah wrote it, I'm so mad because he's good at everything. But uh, let's say it was a ghost writer. It may have been. They said, this person is a beautiful writer, always turns things in on time. They'll do it in a month. Uh, they'll capture Trevor's voice. Let's bring them in and have them write it. So there are like a lot of ghost writers. All they have is being absolute, astonishingly good professional writers. Great. That's all you need. Now, most of us want to write, meaning we want to write our own stuff. So that may not be what you're looking for. But let's talk for a minute about platform. So most of us, uh, and this is true in publishing too, like a lot of professionals think this, uh, most of us, when we think of platform, we think of how many Twitter followers do you have? How many uh, followers on Instagram, Facebook? Uh, how many people are on your email list? Like those sorts of questions. And for many of us, it might be uh, you know 75 Twitter followers and 300 Facebook friends. And so what you're hearing as you're taking your book out different places is people are saying to you, your platform is not big enough. So, so just remember, that's not all they're saying, right? They're saying, this one's a disqualifier given what I see in your professionalism and what I see in your idea, like the book you're presenting here. It seems like your platform is not sufficient together for this to be a deal. So I have a friend who is a beautiful poetic writer uh, who got a book with a book deal with very, very little platform. Uh, if you look at my platform, it's not enormous. Uh, you know, it's better than average for an average person. Uh, but if you look at uh, a lot of big name authors, for sure, it's much smaller than that. So, but, so let's talk about this with platform. Some people just feel despair. They're like, I can't get to 20,000 Twitter followers. Uh, but here's the thing. When we're talking about platform, we're not only talking about social media. That is a part of it. What we're talking about is what is your reach? Who can you connect with? So let's say, let's say you're uh, writing a book about, uh, I don't know, martial arts, let's say. Uh, you're an expert in it. You've been doing it for 20 years and you know everyone in the martial arts community, like you've won some sort of national championship, something like that, and you have zero followers on social media, let's say. Well, you still have a pretty big reach into that community. And that's what we're talking about with platform. Who do you know? Who would uh, write you an endorsement? That's part of platform. Who are you connected to? And what communities are you gonna open doors to that your publisher probably doesn't have a lot of contacts into? Uh, so the topic of your book, especially nonfiction, can really transform 
uh, what your platform is, who are you connected to, who is willing to write for you. So, so uh, we'll see, you see this in Hollywood probably more than elsewhere, but you'll see that somebody's sibling, famous person's sibling, uh, gets a book deal uh, and they have multiple famous actors who give them a, you know, a quote about the book. Uh, well, that's part of your platform and it's okay. You should use those things. So don't think of platform only as social media. Think of it as where am I connected? Do you go to a big church? Are you at a church of 10,000 and friends with all the leadership there? Uh, and you think that possibly they will announce your book from up front? Great. You should probably mention that in your proposal. Uh, are you in a professional capacity somewhere where you're connected to a lot of people in a, in a specific way? You should mention that. Uh, don't despair about platform. You work on it if you can, for sure. We could do another podcast about platform and, and how to grow it, for sure. Um, so yeah, platform can be much more than social media. It can be the connections you have into your communities, professionally, uh, and, and elsewhere. So whatever that might be. And depending on the type of book you're doing, especially nonfiction, what uh, what audiences are you connected to that you're bringing in with you? Um, the one thing I will say this as a writer, controlling platform is harder. You, you've got to learn how to do it. Uh, and the thing you can control is whether you're writing and and growing as a writer. So you can always make yourself a more professional, better writer, and you can always keep generating new ideas. And again, if you have amazing ideas and you're a professional, then uh, that is stuff that can really be transformative as you're sharing your proposal. Uh, let me say one more thing about professionalism too. When a professional uh, editor or agent is looking at your book proposal, which we'll talk about in a minute, what they're looking for when they say, are you a professional, is some evidence that you have written at a professional level. So what that means is, uh, have you sold a short story to a magazine that's well-respected? Uh, so there are plenty of people that uh, have written a, an award-winning short story, let's say, and then suddenly gotten a book deal afterwards. Why? Because it's very, very easy at that point to say, oh, I'm a professional, of course, I got this award, or even I was nominated for this award, or I was published in this magazine. And we'll see at the very end when I go through my story, it doesn't have to be a big magazine. It just has to be a professional magazine. Um, so what, what looks unprofessional, right? Okay, so that doesn't tell us anything about your professionalism except that you write, which is really good. And it tells us something about a little bit of your reach, which isn't bad, but it's not impressive either. So when you get hosted on someone else's big blog, let's say, uh, yeah, that matters. If you get hosted on a professional uh, blog of some sort, uh, if you get hosted in a professional magazine, things like that. Uh, and of course, if you, uh, sometimes someone has a post that goes viral and they get interviewed on a, uh, a morning show or something. That's part of your platform. That's great. Um, but yeah, have you written for a newspaper? Have you done uh, opinion names, things like that? My 10-year-old, by the way, is is watching here and is leaving little messages on the... Uh, hello? Uh, leaving little messages on here. She told me she'd be watching along. Um, so professionalism, part of what we're looking for is... Uh, so that could be almost anything. Maybe in your job, you do some professional writing. So say you're a copywriter. Totally. That shows that you're a professional. You can meet a deadline. Uh, even something as small as, uh, let's say, uh, I mean, probably not a church newsletter. Maybe. It, basically, what you're looking for is some place that you can prove that you can write to a deadline and that you can write well, and and here's what here's what they're worried about. Here's what they don't want. You don't want to get an amazing idea, small platform, hire this person, buy their idea, and then discover that they're terrible to work with, that they miss every deadline, that they're abusive to editors, that they say horrible things. Um, so Carrie uh, right now is saying she's a technical writer who wants to write other things. That's perfect, Carrie. 
because your technical writing, uh, yes, and Sarah says, what about writing for a curriculum publication? Yes, yes, perfect. The, what these, even if it's not what you want to write, what it shows is that you can write professionally because what they're worried about is they're going to walk into this relationship, this work relationship, that's going to go for a year at least, maybe 18 months with a smaller publisher, maybe two years, uh, as far as just this book. And then you're going to be a jerk who doesn't know how to do the work. And if that happens, that's a problem. It's a problem for them. It's part of their quality of life and probably the quality of this project. So that's what they're trying to avoid. And that's why they want to see, they want you to prove that you're a professional in, in your proposal. So let's talk about proposals. Uh, here's, here's what happens to me all the time. I, I write a, a decent amount in some spiritual spaces, right? Religious spaces. So I'll get these emails from people that say things like this. Uh, I was praying and God told me to write a book. And so I'm going to, even though I don't know anything about writing and I'm writing to you so you can introduce me to the person who's going to make this happen. Well, uh, even as a deeply religious person, this kind of email, I don't want to say it's offensive, um, but it's not one I'm going to spend a lot of time on. I, I will probably, if I have time, write a polite email back. Uh, but what's happening here is this person is showing me they don't have even the smallest idea of what they're entering into as far as being a professional. And that's, uh, it's not worth my time, right? If they're not able to Google, what should I do to get published? If they're not able to watch something like this, why am I going to do all this work to explain it to them? Uh, and again, depending on relationship, depending on how long we've known each other, depending on variety of things. They might get more of an interaction than another. Um, but here's the thing about proposals. So a proposal often, uh, okay, so Addison, let, let's ask, answer Addison's question real quick. Addison says, uh, if I write for young adults from uh, about a high school junior to early 20s, and I teach in a large high school, well known within the district, how would I best la leverage that with an agent or publisher? Would you just come out and say it? Uh, I think my connection is a little slow. Sorry if my questions are out of order. No, you're fine. Uh, so so here's, here's the deal. That's a perfect example, Addison. If you're writing for young adults, fiction or nonfiction, and say you've been writing or you've been teaching high school for five years, absolutely that is a kind of thing you want to mention to publishers because what it says to them is, I'm not somebody who's been out of touch with high, uh, high schoolers for 20 years. This happens all the time, right? I'm 70. Uh, I have good memories from high school, and I want to write a book for high schoolers. I don't know any. I don't like high schoolers. I haven't spoken to them since I was you know, in high school, uh, but I'd like to write a book for them. No one wants that. Uh, well, no, I, 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 that may not be true. <laughs> maybe they do. Uh, maybe uh, there's a big audience of 70-year-olds for that. I'm not sure. The... Uh, so yes, Addison, to say I'm a teacher and I love working with young adults and I want to write for young adults, yeah, let us know. That goes to professionalism too, right? Let us know that you know the target audience. That lets me know you're a professional, you're doing your research. Good. Yes. Thank you for the question. Okay. So proposals. A proposal is you convincing a publisher or an agent to enter into a business relationship with you and your project. So, and that's really important is to remember the business piece. So the people who are emailing me and saying, God told me to do this and now tell me everything I need to do and take away all the work, as Zach says in here, uh, that doesn't mean you're not gonna have to work hard, right? Just because God said something to you, you might still have a lot of work to do. Uh, a business proposal. So what you need to understand is this. A publisher, let's say they give you a small advance. An advance is money a publisher gives you to purchase your book. Uh, and basically, it's, it's called an advance because it's an advance on royalties. And you get to keep that money no matter what happens. If the book doesn't sell any copies, well, not no matter what. But, <laughs> you know, there's usually some, there's a lot of legal stuff in there. Like, if you don't turn in the book, they might come after you. Um, and they should. You're not being professional. 
But uh, the idea is this. If, say I'm a publisher, and you have this amazing idea, and I want to purchase it, let's say I give you a, a, what is relatively small but actually common uh, advance, which is $5,000. And you're thinking, oh, these people are spending $5,000 on my book. No. No, because they're hiring the editors that are working on it. They're paying all front costs on the design. They're purchasing the books. They have salespeople that are going around and trying to convince other places uh, to uh, hold your book. They have PR people that are trying to connect. They're, they're paying for advertising. Like even a small book, you're usually talking at least tens of thousands of dollars. So keep that in mind when you're writing your proposal. This isn't something to just slap together and send out. Right? Uh, and it could be that they're paying significantly more than that on the advance, on you know keeping the lights on at the publisher, all these things. So, what if it was fifty grand? What if it was a hundred grand? Does that change the amount of time and effort you're going to put in to making your proposal look professional? I think so. Uh, so Dana asks, is there a difference? between a query letter and a proposal? Yes. I'm not going to go deeply into a query letter, but here's basically what a query letter is. A query letter is a professional letter, one page or less, that you're giving the most bold. We don't have Taylor. She's not going to write this. Say, uh, have you ever wondered why legs on your table are the way they are? This book's going to answer that question. Regency era furniture. That's why, right? Ooh, everyone's getting excited who's into furniture. You write the, find the right publisher. They're going to get so excited. What you're going to do is you're going to have a hook in there about why the book's amazing. You're going to tell them about yourself. I'm a high school teacher that on the side creates Regency era furniture. Uh, and I've been published at regencyfurniture.com as well as in the well-known magazine. Check out the legs on that table, right? And you're going to take all of this and just boil it down the most, most interesting things about your thing. You're going to put it in the letter and say, I've got a book for you. It's really the query letter is for a, an agent or a publisher to be able to look at it and just quickly say, yeah, I want to know more about this. So it's an advertisement is what it is. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we can talk more about that in the future. Um, so uh proposal wise okay good question actually so there's a couple in here uh we'll get to that editing question um let's see john john says this uh do you ever fear someone will steal your idea when submitting a proposal what are the ethical rules uh here's the reality in the traditional publishing world that the risk of someone stealing your idea is almost zero. Uh, because what happens is, say you steal my idea and it becomes public knowledge, no one wants to work with you anymore. No agents want to work with you, no other publishers, no other authors. Uh, and authors are gossips, I promise you. I know all sorts of things about publishers that I've never worked with uh, because of the gossip from my friends who do work with them. Sometimes it's really good things. I love that. And sometimes it's like, don't trust this guy. He doesn't pay. Uh, there's an agent that uh, a lot of my friends have said, don't talk to this person. He just goes around trying to scam people. Um, so the likelihood someone's going to steal your idea is very, very slim. Uh, and since most of this stuff is done by email these days with almost all your, all your folks, uh, you have a paper trail too. You know, it's not actual paper, it's e-paper uh, that kind of shows this was my idea that I pitched at this time. Uh, and here's exactly what it looked like, all this. So it's not it's not something I, I literally ever think about. Uh, not that no one's ever taken an idea of mine in some way, but no, no professional in publishing I work with or have pitched to has ever done that, ever. Um, again, yeah, not that, not that uh, it could never happen. Okay. So the business proposal is basically this. There's the query letter, which we mentioned, right? That's an important piece. It's the advertisement, just the short little advertisement that says, here's what's amazing. I've got this incredible idea, one sentence. I'm this, the book that shows that it's a good 
fit for you, right? I don't want to pitch a fantasy novel to an agent who hates fantasy and science fiction. So if he reads the last thing and he goes, it's a 300 thousand word fantasy epic he's like i only do romance i don't want this uh so so it also shows you've been doing your homework right i know that you love regency era furniture and that is what i'm giving you 100 right so so that's the query letter and then the proposal is basically there's a little difference with fiction and nonfiction, so i'll mention that but the proposal is basically this everything i told you about those first three things that they want to know what is your amazing idea uh, are you a professional and what is your platform? So what's your idea? Sell us on it, make it amazing. Show us why you're going to be a delight to work with. That does not mean by the way, sending cookies with your proposals. They actually hate that. They don't know you. Uh, and it makes them feel really scared and weird when they get cookies from strangers. Um, and, and three, what is your platform? Which the question is, how are you going to help us sell this? We're going to do our work. What are you going to do to help sell it? Okay. If you look at the first comment on this live video, uh, I, I've put a link to my various social media places, as well as the last link on there is a link to one of my book proposals. It's a nonfiction book proposal that actually got a book deal. Now I took some of my information out of it, but what you'll see is it kind of, it tells you what the idea of the book is, tells you who the audience is. That's really important. Who am I targeting? Young adults. Uh, millennials, people 60 to 65, females of this age, doesn't matter. What, who is your audience, your main audience? Don't say everyone. No one likes that uh, because it tells us that you're not sure how to sell your book. So don't say everybody will love this. Let us decide that. So give us your primary audience. Who are you targeting? Why is this going to change their life? Uh, and then an outline for nonfiction so the outline basically says, okay, so for nonfiction, you don't write the whole book before you sell it. You write a proposal, you write an outline, and you write about three chapters. So the outline tells us, here's the 10 chapters, and then you show us the first two or three. I would say three. Uh, because publishers actually prefer with nonfiction that you don't have it finished. They might want to change the direction a little bit. In fact, I have a book that uh, was purchased by my publisher uh, at that time. It was one of the bigger publishers, Simon & Schuster. So it's a book called Sky Lantern. The book I pitched to them was not the book they wanted. They purchased it and then the editor called me and said, we would like you to go another direction with this if you're open to it. We'll take this book if that's what you want, but we'd really like to go this other direction. We talked about it and that's what we ended up doing. So I threw out some of the chapters I'd already written and did something completely different on the same topic. So that can happen. So with nonfiction, you want the proposal, uh, which you can see an example in, in uh, by clicking there, it'll take you to a Google Doc. Um, for a religious book I wrote uh, about, for religious people, how to talk about their faith in a way that uh, doesn't like alienate people is the idea behind it. The um, So you want that piece, the proposal, you have the query letter, the proposal, and then you have the outline as part of the proposal, and then the first two or three chapters. So that's nonfiction. In fiction, it's almost the same, except instead of an outline and three chapters, uh, you need a synopsis, which is gonna be a short retelling of your entire book, and you need three chapters to start, but in fiction, you need to write the whole book. And the reason is this, uh, let's say you're writing romance, and it's Amish romance, which is a very popular genre, actually. By the way, if you want to break into fiction, the number one easiest way to do it is romance. Romance is constantly looking for new authors. Uh, and it is the number one best-selling genre in the publishing industry. So if you want to break in, romance is a great way to do it. So let's say you're writing an Amish romance. You pitch the idea. It's really great. And they look at the synopsis. And then they read the book and they discover in the last two chapters, you're like talking about these characters, uh, Hans, you know, is the heartthrob. And at the end, in the last two pages, you discover he's actually an alien from the dark side of the moon. And they're like, what are you doing? We don't want this. That's, that's not the promise of your book, right? So in fiction, they want to see the whole story. 
they want to read it all the way through. Now, you're not going to get to show that to an agent or a publisher until they're pretty interested. Um, but that's the uh, that's what you're going to need before you start sending it around. Because what you don't want is for an agent to reach out to you and say, I read your first three chapters. They're amazing. Send me the rest of your novel. And you say like, oh, it's not done yet. Because what does that tell them? That you're not professional. And therefore, they don't want to work with you. Uh, so don't do that. So that's the basics on a proposal. And the big thing, again, just remembering, this is a business proposal. So, so something I see when I'm at writers' conferences a lot, someone will send me their proposal, and we'll be looking at it together, and it'll say something like this. We'll get to the platform section. It'll say, uh, been a high school teacher for 10 years uh, at a school with 10,000 people at it. I'm by far the most popular teacher, let's say. I don't, I'm terrible at social media though. I hate it. I only have, you know, I try not to go on the internet at all. I only have five followers on Twitter. Listen, would you do that in a business proposal? Are you going to tell them every horrific thing about yourself? No. Uh, a business proposal is about telling them the benefits of what you're doing. What is good about it? Uh, if you don't put anything about your social media, they will ask you what it is but they're going to make the assumption it's low, which it might be, right? And that's okay. But what you want to be careful about, I, I see this a lot with novice writers, don't talk yourself down. Don't say how terrible you are. Don't, if you have internal insecurities, which you probably do because a lot of us artistic people are neurotic in one way or another, don't put that in your business proposal. Let us get to know you and after we know that you're a delightful, wonderful person that we wanted to do business with, or we can go, oh, they're a little insecure too. Great. Um, don't put that in your, please, please, don't put that in your business proposals, okay? So don't talk yourself down. Okay, let me pause and I'm going to look real quick through your questions. Let's see, Ronica says, what would you say to someone who went to school for English, creative writing, ended up in a different field, and is now looking to get back to writing? Ronica, I would say that I'm guessing, having been a creative writing major, that you know what you need to do, which is start writing. Uh, I talk to people all the time who want to be writers or who tell me they could be writers. And what they mean by that is, in my head, theoretically, I could do what you or someone else is doing, which is very likely to be true. Uh, but start writing. Uh, figure out what you want to do. And I find, honestly, uh, let's say I don't have a good idea. The more I write, the more ideas I have. Uh, right now, I'm under contract for six books, and I've written one of them, and I'm in the middle of writing my second. Not even the middle. That's generous. I'm in the very beginning of writing the second one. Um, and I have so many ideas for more books. It's amazing. I'm so excited about all these projects. I cannot do because I'm under contract for others, which is a beautiful problem that I love. And this is the first time in my writing career that's been true. Uh, and I'm so excited to be at this place, so thankful for my publishers and for my agent. Um, but the more you write, the more ideas you're going to have and the better they're going to be. Uh, so that's, let's see, Sarah says, oh, agent question. Uh, we'll talk about agents in a minute. Actually, we're talking about agents next. And then we're going to talk about rejection as well. Okay, good. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's talk about agents. Good. Uh, perfect timing, Sarah. Should you get an agent? So my opinion is yes. You'll find people who don't. There are some decent size authors that what they do is they just hire a, a lawyer to go through their contracts. I love my agent. Uh, I love him. As a human being, I love him. And then I love him because he makes my life better so often. Just a great guy. Uh, one of the things I love the most about being in publishing are the amazing people I've met. Some of you actually uh, listening right now are people I've met through my writing, like Dana, who's on here somewhere. We met at a uh, book conference, which is so fun. Uh, yeah, when I was signing books, she came by, which is really cool. Um, uh, if this is the Ronica, I think it is. We met because I was speaking uh, at something uh, at a church where her family attends. That might be a different Ronica, though. Not sure. Okay. So <laughs> Dana's excited. She got a shout out. Good. Okay. Sorry. My connection is unstable. Let's see if we can catch up here. 
pausing just for a second. Okay, there we go. Agents, why do you want an agent? Here's the deal. A lot of publishing is networking, okay? An agent is a professional who knows a whole bunch about publishing that you don't, and that's their job. And not only that, they're the money people. Now, the way an agent works is if you hire an agent, and remember, you are hiring them, uh, you're the customer, right? The agent is someone you're hiring, just like if I was putting a wood floor in my house and hiring someone, I'm going to go and look and see who are they. Is this someone I want working on my house? Do I like their work? An agent is someone you're hiring. And the way they make their money is everything of yours they sell, they get 15% of what you get. So you don't pay them. You don't hand them uh, $1,000 to start. You shouldn't be paying for photocopies at their office, in my opinion. Uh, what happens is when the publisher sends you a check for 10 grand, 1500 of it goes to your agent. Okay. And the rest comes to you. And a general rule in traditional publishing is this. So remember this, this is important. The flow of money should always be toward the author, which means you shouldn't be putting money out to your publisher. You shouldn't be putting money out to your agent. Your agent should get paid. Your publisher should get paid, but they get paid by taking your work and getting it out into the world, okay? So uh, you might be paying for an editor, you know, maybe some people like to have a personal editor that they pay for something, that's fine. But you should be paying your publisher, like if your publisher says, oh, we have this editorial service we think you should use. I don't think that's probably the best publisher then, in my opinion. They might ask you to go get a professional publisher, great. But if they're telling you use our in-house publisher or our in-house that you should pay, I don't love that practice. I don't think it's professional, typically. Um, so let's see. Okay, so agents, here we go. Agents should be, get 15%, and, and a good agent is going to do a variety of things. Well, and it depends a little bit on what you want from your agent. What an agent will do for sure is they're going to know which publishers to send your books to that they think will buy it. They have relationships with those people. They know what they're looking for. And they're going to take that book and then walk it through the process of getting an offer. And when that offer comes, they're going to know things you don't. Uh, so for instance, uh, what percentage should your royalty be as an author? Should it be different for a hardcover than for a soft cover than for an ebook? What if they end up doing a gift version of your book, like with a bunch of photos? Should you get a different percentage then? Uh, how many free books should you get uh, as part of your deal? Now, you might think authors get all their books free. You don't. You have to purchase them. Uh, how much should you pay for those books? These are all things an agent's on top of. And let's say uh, your publisher comes to you and says, here's the deal, $10,000 at this percentage. Uh, the percentage goes up when you sell a certain amount. You get this number of free books, like this sort of stuff. Your agent is going to go back to them and say, hey, we like a lot of things about this deal. Here's what we want to change. So for instance, I don't sell my film rights to my publisher ever. So an agent does that. And what's wonderful is that if you ever have a financial issue with your publisher, say my publisher, this has never happened to me, by the way, but let's say it did. Say my publisher has not sent a payment for royalties. Uh, but I need to keep a good relationship with them because I'm working on my next book with them. Well, I don't even have to tell them that I haven't gotten the check. I call my agent and say, hey, could you check on this? I didn't get my check. And he's like, well, that's weird. I didn't get mine either. And then he'll call and take care of it. Or she will call and take care of it, which is amazing. I never talk about, I rarely talk about uh, my personal business, money and things like that with the people who are making the book with me, which I personally love. It's great. The other thing, agents are usually great at being coaches, giving you ideas for books, uh, sometimes I have ideas for books. I call and run it past my agent. We kind of talk it out, see if we think it has legs or not. Uh, there's at least once that my wife, Krista, was telling me I should write a book. And I was like, I don't think that's a book. And then I called my agent. And he's like, you need to listen to your wife. That's a great book. Um, so the agents are great. 
with, with all those things. So how do you get one? Well, you need a lot of the same tools, okay? You need a query letter. And most agents will tell you exactly what they want to see from you. Uh, some of them just want a query letter. They want to see the hook. And if you get the hook, they're going to ask you for more. They might write you and say, okay, now send me the first three chapters. Or they might write you and say, okay, now send me a proposal. The ways you can find it, there's a bunch of ways. They're all listed in a variety of places. So uh, every year there's a new book that comes out called Writer's Market. If you're writing uh, in the Christian realm, there's also a Christian Writer's Market book that comes out every year, which will emphasize sort of the Christian uh, Christian places, Christian market, Christian Writer's Market Guide, I think it's called. Um, so there's the 2020 Writer's Market the 2020 Christian Writers Market Guide. And what it is, it's just a big fat book that will walk you through every publisher, every agent that wants to be listed in that book. Uh, oftentimes they're also searchable on the internet. You get a code when you buy the book that lets you search as well. There are also places, so a couple places you can look, there's publishersmarketplace.com uh, has agents listed. There's a place called Agent Query. Dot com, which has a searchable database. It has maybe, I don't know, a thousand agents on it. Uh, and there's a place called querytracker.net. Uh, all of these places have places uh, that you can go in and you can kind of say, okay, I'm writing a young adult uh, fantasy novel and I'm looking for agents that are open because not agents aren't always looking for clients, right? But I'm looking for agents who are open uh, who can do that? And then it'll bring up all those names for you. And then you have to look at each one and see how they want to be approached. It's different for different people. There's this old dude in New York that only wants paper copies sent in a manila envelope. Cool. If you want him, do what he says. And this is a test of professionalism again. Or there'll be some named Jerry, right? And Jerry's a woman and says, please don't call me Mr. Jerry. It makes me mad. And I won't delete your email, but do you want me reading it while I'm mad? Right? Um, so, uh, is the writer's market and the market guide and the Christian writer's market guide, uh, are they the same? They're not exactly the same, uh, but they're similar, right? So they might have different publishers in them. Uh, so the regular writer's market guide will have publishers that would never be in the, so it'll have new age publishers, for instance, which won't be in the Christian writer's guide. Um, some of the big publishers will still be in the Christian Writer's Guide because they they do inspirational books, let's say, or they have a, a different like department within their publisher that deals with religious books of whatever kind. Um, when it comes to actually approaching an agent, uh, you can do what's called simultaneous submissions. That means you're writing multiple agents at once. It's not rude. You will find some agents that say, please don't do this. Typically that means they get back to you pretty fast uh, and, and they hate it when they find something they love and it's already gone to another agent. When I was looking for agents, what I did was this. I made a top 30 list, okay? So the agents I most wanted. So what you're looking for is they only charge 15%. They have a track record in his genre. Flip to the back of your favorite Dan Brown book, look at the acknowledgments and see if he thinks his agent. And then you go put that person on your list if they're taking people. Um, so you take you make your top 30, let's say. And then what I did is I took the top 10, like the absolute top ones, my dream agents. And then, oops, sorry, I hit the mic there. So each one, you're probably going to have to personalize it, right? You don't want to go dear agent. You want to, it's again, business, everything you can to make a personal connection, show them, you know, about them, mention that you love authors that they are, sh that they are representing, let them know that you did your research. Uh, or if you have a personal connection, it's like my aunt. So, so you're going to approach them and you're going to do whatever they say, query letter, uh, attach a proposal or don't attach a proposal. Some of them want to just paste it into the email because they don't want to open your stuff in case it has viruses. We're all very sensitive about viruses computer and otherwise right now. Uh, so things like that, right? And sorry, it's probably my my internet here. Uh, I can share or post that somewhere in written form. Yeah, that's easy. But basically, someone with a track record of selling, someone who sells in your genre, 
uh, and someone who is a professional, meaning they take 15%, not 20, not 25, uh, and someone who's open to, uh, to new people. And when they show interest, when you get to that place, you want to have a phone call and get to know each other a little bit. This is someone you're going to be working with. You want to make sure you like each other because uh, it'll make your life better. Uh, you may have some personal things you want to. So like for me, I really, I'm the worst. I really like a lot of personal interaction with my editors, my agent. I want someone I can pick up the phone and call without an appointment. And that's what I have, right? There was another agent who offered me representation and he was the kind of guy that you had to set up an appointment at every time. And it was a real quick, okay, let's do the business. Great. Now I'll go sell the book, which is fine. That's what some people want, but it's not for me. It's not what I wanted. Uh, some people want someone who's more of a coach. Great. Yeah. Go get that person. Some people want somebody who's going to be really in the depths with them, maybe a former editor that's going to like really dig into their stuff and polish it. Cool. There are, there are agents who do that. Um, now, when your first 10 come back and you get a rejection, which could happen and has happened to me, what do you do? Do you give up? Nope. Uh, you go on to the next 10. Okay. And uh, then you go to the next 10. And if those 10 don't get through your first 30, here's what I do. I decide, do I want to do another project to get me one of my top 30 or do I just need an agent for this project? And if your answer is I just need an agent, then you do another top 30 and you start going through those and, uh, and you keep going till you get somebody. The other thing to be looking for, uh, your if an agent keeps asking you for more, like say you say a query and they go, ooh, I want to see the first three chapters. Good. Your query is working then. It's just the hook, remember? So if they're not taking you, sometimes if they really like you, they're going to give you feedback. I've had agents do that. Like I was really interested, but your your three chapters did not hold my attention. Someone told me that. Uh, and what they're saying is the writing's not good enough. It's not what I pictured from your, from your pitch. That's actually super valuable information that I want to know. So, uh, I usually, between each time that I'm sending out to new set of agents, I'm like tweaking my stuff to try and make it better. I'm using it like a beta thing, right? I still stop start at the top. That's my thing. I want the top people to get it. Uh, I want them to love me. I do nonfiction and fiction. Do you have one agent for all of your writing? I do, actually. Uh, he is by far more respected and well-known in Christian publishing as well as nonfiction publishing. He and I had a conversation a couple of years ago where I said, hey, I want to push into the YA space, young adult space, uh, and fantasy and science fiction. And he said, you know, I don't really know much about that. Uh, I don't have connections there. If you want to get a second agent, you can. I kind of dabbled with that. I sent out a couple queries and, uh, but then I got a deal. I, I made a connection directly with a publisher uh, Tyndale, right? Who I have a long relationship with for my fantasy trilogy. And he knows Tyndale. They love him and they love me and we love them. So we just made it happen. Um, but are there people who have two agents? Yeah, there are. Uh, I would say if you know already that you want to write in, let's say, uh, mystery and fantasy, find somebody that represents both. Uh, or if you're like fiction and nonfiction, find somebody who represents both on the front end, if you can. Um, once you have an agent, do you have to write a proposal for each new idea you have? Well, yeah, eventually you do. So what happens with my agent? I'll call him. I say, uh, think about my next project. I have three ideas. I'll pitch them all to him. I say, I'm most excited about idea number two. He goes, Ooh, number one though, somebody at this publisher just asked me for a book like that. Oh, okay. Uh, so then I'm going to go write a proposal for my agent to take to the publisher. Uh, oh, I should mention this. Can you get a book offer without an agent? Yes. Some publishers will accept what they call unsolicited manuscripts. So you could end up with a deal, an offer, without an agent. This is by far because agents will get 15% for making the deal for you. So call your number one agent. Well, not call them probably. Send them an email and say, look, I just got offered a deal for this book. Do you want to help me? And probably they'll say like, uh, actually, yeah, I would love 15% of that deal. And then you have an agent, which is great. Um, there's already really strong relationship with the publisher. And there was a proposal of some kind, meaning we had a conversation and I wrote up some notes. 
uh, or they said, here's a book that I'd be interested in, some notes together, right? Or uh, recently, actually, this week, I actually got the email today, actually. Uh, I haven't signed the contract yet, but a contract sent today for a book where they said, okay, you've written one book for us like this. We want other books just like it on a, like, I can't go into the details right now, but a different topic, basically. Uh, so I didn't have to do a proposal. They, they used the previous book and the previous proposal to say, like this, but different, right? So, but that's way down the line for most of us. Uh, if you become John Grisham or Stephen King or uh, any number of kind of Danielle Steele, kind of a big name like that, I'm guessing you don't have eventually because they're going to make a million bucks off you. They don't really care what you're, that's probably an exaggeration. They do care. Um, the platform is so big at that point that the sale is you picking up the phone and calling your editor, right? Um, and that's why actually some authors will get uh, John Scalzi, who's a science fiction author, delightful person, amazing writer, got this enormous deal that was for over the course of, I can't remember, 10 years. And if John were watching this, he could give us the details, 15 books or something. Why does he get that? Because the publisher loves him. His books always sell. Uh, so he made some sort of proposal that walked through, here's the basic idea of what I think those 15 books will be, but it wasn't a full-fledged proposal for each no. So the more successful you get, the less business proposal you have to do, just like in any other business. Um, so that's agents. Uh, agents are great. I love agents. I love my agent. I love my publisher. Could I do everything without my agent at this point? I mean, there are deals I've brought to my agent, right? Where my publisher and I have talked and said, let's do this. Uh, I still want my agent involved. The 15% is well worth it. Uh, and to be honest, he's done a lot work, a lot more work than the money he's made off of my career at this point, in my opinion. It's been money very, very well spent. Um, and he's a good friend at this point as well. Uh, as are many of the people in publishing. And, and let me say that, by the way, uh, you see on TV all the time the jerk author that everyone hates, but they sell so much. Those people exist. They are real. Uh, publishers hate them. Agents hate them, uh, but they make money. Don't You don't want to be that person. What you want to be is the person that everyone loves, that when they see the phone ringing and they're like, oh, it's Matt, they're like, oh, ho, ho, wonderful. I want to talk to Matt, right? So when I have some idea I want to bounce off him, I send him a text or send my agent a text or whatever, that they're excited to hear from me, that we're friends, uh, or, or at least professional coworkers who like each other, right? So two more things, three more things here, and then I'll share my story. So I'm going to talk briefly about writers' conferences, uh, a couple of practical things. Actually, I think we've covered those pretty well. And then I want to talk briefly about rejection. Good. Are they worth the money? Uh, a lot of them are actually. And here's why. Now, did, I didn't go to a single writer's conference before I broke in as a professional. They're not necessary, uh, but they can be really good for, for two basic reasons. One is uh, if you need to grow on your skills, right? It could be that your skill level, you're just like, I don't know how to do a proposal. Um, great. That's fine. Uh, then go. there will definitely be someone at a writer's conference who can help you with that. Uh, I, I'm not sure on villains in fiction at the last uh, writer's conference I was at, or one of the recent ones anyway. Um, so stuff like that is always good. The, the second thing, and I think possibly the more uh, potentially powerful thing at a lot of writer's conferences is the networking. You don't know if the person sitting next to you is going to be a New York Times bestseller six months from then probably a year from then, right? And there are always professional agents and professional editors at writer's conferences, especially the bigger ones. So like our, uh, they're going to coach you, they're going to give you advice, and they're hoping that when you have your million dollar idea, that you're going to be connected to them. You're going to go like, oh, I know that guy, I met him at the conference, and you're going to send them an email, right? You're going to say like, oh, I met that editor, she's really delightful, I wonder if she'd be interested, this is kind of in her alley, right? And you reach out to her. That they want to be involved with you. So networking wise, it's amazing. I've made really good connections uh, as a professional already at writers conferences. And one of the delightful things, by the way, about being a writer, once you're a professional of any kind, so even 
writing professional magazine articles, let's say, or writing for a newspaper or, or anything like that. What you'll find is other professionals are going to be a lot easier to access uh, because they know you're not going to waste their time with uh, things that they don't have time to spend time on, like how do you write a query letter, right? Um, that you could just Google. Um, again, I'm not saying you can't reach out to me. You are people I know mostly, uh, and we have relationships, so that's different. But if you're going to send a note to Stephen King, right? Stephen King, I want to write a horror novel, read books in the next 10 minutes. Uh, he doesn't have time to answer an email like that. So uh, this is being recorded, by the way. So hopefully it won't have the buffering and missing pieces. Sorry about that. Um, by the way, I did recently upgrade my internet. So hopefully hopefully it's not just on my end. Uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll take a look at this and try to make sure it's, it's all good. But this will all be recorded and you'll be able to access it at the same link you came in on. Um, so networking is a huge piece of writers' conferences. So on the practical side, uh, I just wanted to remind you on a nonfiction proposal, it's the query, it's the uh, proposal, three chapters, and an outline. And for a fiction, it's gonna you need to write the full manuscript, and you want the first three chapters, which is the most that most people are going to look at to start, to be perfect. I mean, beautiful, perfect, polished. Uh, and then same thing, proposal and query letter. Um, so <laughs> Zach says, internet is bad everywhere right now because we have nowhere else to go. It's true. It's true. Uh, yeah. Yep, it's true. Okay. Rejection, and then I'll tell you my story real quick, and then we'll uh, we'll call it a night. Rejection. A lot of us think one day I'm going to get published and rejection will be over. Agents have been rejecting me. Publishers have been rejecting me. But one day that will not be true anymore. And that is not the case. Rejection is a permanent part of the writer's life. Even if you write something beautiful, an agent loves it, publishers get in a bidding war over it, it's a New York Times bestseller, you're going to get mean reviews. You're going to get people saying weird, dumb stuff to you like... Uh, <laughs> this one cracks me up. People do this all the time. It doesn't hurt my feelings at this point at all because I've been doing this for 10 years. I'll meet someone and they're like, oh, Matt Michelotis, I've heard of you. You're a, you're an author. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's nice to meet you. And they'll say, uh, I've never read any of your books. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, I just kind of assumed you probably hadn't. I don't like meet people on the street and go like, I bet they've read my books. I'm not, you know, I'm not a New York Times bestseller. So that people say stuff like that to you all the time. You'll always have some author that's uh, got a full page ad in your favorite magazine and you got nothing, uh, things like that. So rejection is constant. It's a part of the life. So what we need to learn is not how to avoid the... Uh, not how to avoid rejection, but how to use rejection as a tool, a tool in two senses. So when I'm trying out, um, here's how I think of it. When I'm sending out, I even send my book out or my story, let's say. A D uh, is at least I wrote something, let's say. A C is that I wrote something, and maybe I sent it to the wrong place. I didn't do my best job. I wrote Mike Michelotis instead of Matt Michelotis in the query letter. I feel dumb, whatever. But I submitted it somewhere, uh, and I got a rejection. That's a C. That's average, okay, for a professional. Writing and submitting. A B is a rejection with some sort of personal response. My uh, professional writer friends call it rejectomancy. It's like trying to read everything you can into the rejection. Uh, did I get a normal response from the editor? Did I get uh, just one note? Like, And it could be something like, uh, <laughs> my first novel, oh, this is rough. My first novel, uh, my first book, right? It's Imaginary Jesus. It's this one. Look how fun it is. Look at the cover. It's great. Uh, one of the publishers we sent it to who rejected it through my agent. This is terrible. I don't know why he said this. He sent a note that said, uh, this is a really fun idea. I think it would make a good short story, but not a book, right? So what he's saying is, I don't think there's enough there for it to be a book. That stung. Obviously, I still remember it like almost 12 years later. Um, why is that helpful for rejection? 
well, it's telling me something about the work and how the readers are receiving it. So rejection in that sense is really helpful. What do I learn? Uh, so when I had an agent say the first three chapters didn't hold me or, or uh, the switching point of views made it hard for me to connect with your character. Okay, that's really helpful. Uh, now, sometimes once you're published, people writing reviews, they're, they're not the people you wrote for. So if I wrote a, a fantasy novel and someone writes one star, uh, I hate stories that have magic in it. Why? Why did you buy my book? That's not helpful. Um, so there's the sense in which rejection can be really helpful in me navigating. Do I have the skills, abilities, and professionalism to do what I'm trying to do here? Is my book represent itself well? Is my proposal getting, I'll hear people say, publishers don't understand me and that's why they won't pick up my book. Oh, guess what? That's on you. That is not on the publisher. Your job as a business person, as a salesperson, is to make it clear to them. So if it's not clear to them, rejection is telling you, you haven't perfected your pitch uh, or your, your project is not quite right. Great, work on it. And we all know stories about someone who got rejected 8 million times and their book became a ginormous bestseller. Yes, okay, somehow they figured it out along the way. They found someone or something switched, something changed. That's okay. The other way I find rejection really helpful, and this is less about writing and more about being a writer, is that rejection is a tool for the growth of my character. Uh, if you become so wrapped up in your writing uh, and in your work that you can't take harsh words, that you can't take rejection, that you can't take someone who dislikes your work, then that is a character flaw that is preventing me from improving and preventing me from being professional. So where those places exist, and they still do, and they probably always will in my life, I need to learn to find them when I feel myself feeling sensitive and go, okay, how do I remove that? How do I not take that personally? This is a business thing. How do I change my character? How do I grow? so that I can take whatever you want to throw at me. So the business part is the bane of my existence, someone says. Yes, I hear you. Many of us want to write and not do business, and that's reality. But being professional means money is coming to you. And unfortunately, whenever money crosses palms, business becomes a part of it. So that's part of being a professional. The writing part is this little piece we want to keep safe. And then there's, the, it's why I've never submitted anything. Okay, yes. The business part is why you've never submitted anything or the rejection part. Well, either way, this is a serious thing. You want to make sure that you are able to move to a place that you've built some defenses around yourself and your feelings so that you're able to healthily send your work out into the world. Uh, and it's hard. It's like laying a baby out in front of a pack of wolves and saying, do you love this and want to adopt it or would you like to eat it? And you're hoping they'll adopt it, right? But my daughter just walked by laughing. You want them to adopt it, right? <laughs> Not in my books. She said, no, in her books, they get eaten. Her books are pretty dark, actually. She's, she's a writer as well. Um, yeah, so... That's why you got to. That's why you got to look at rejection as a, a tool. Rejection is a good thing to be celebrated. Okay, I have friends who take their rejections, they print them out, and they put them up around their office, and it's a way of saying, like, "I hear you. I'm getting better every day. I'm going to do this." Uh, so rejection can be good, can be valuable, can be. It can. So so maybe we should talk more about that. We'll do a longer thing about rejection. So let me quickly walk you through my story. I won't take a long time on this. I'm really thankful for you guys sticking it out. Here we go. Uh, my story is this. Seriously, in college, just for the college newspaper, stuff like that, mostly because I discovered that I didn't think I had what it took to be a professional actor, which is what I really wanted to be at the time. Uh, so I was a creative writing major, and I was pretty good, actually. So in my department, I was one of the, I mean, uh, I'm not being prideful here. 
uh, just if you're honestly looking at it and talking English, uh, a couple of us have been now. Um, our professors were great, all professionals, all people who had been multiple published, most of them uh, in poetry or uh, literary fiction. So I got out of college and I didn't do anything with it. I, I didn't even write that much. And then I started getting interested. Oh, 15, you know, I'd written a novel that was terrible. I'd written a screenplay, likewise terrible. Um, in fact, one of my professional friends told me the other day, he remembers reading my screenplay once upon a time because we did a live reading. He was like, wow, I still remember it because it was so bad. And he's not wrong. I also remember it for the same reason. Anyway, I start writing articles. And this goes to the professionalism, okay? I started reaching out. What I discovered was there was this little magazine called the Wittenberg Door that was a religious satire magazine. And I started writing articles for them, which was just when I got mad about something in religious culture, I'd write a funny little article about it. And they'd send me like 50 bucks, 70 bucks. The first thing I ever sold that I got money for was a short story to a little, little, not, not a professional market, what we call a semi-pro Mag so and then I started getting 50, 75 bucks, right? And I started writing for some professional magazines and you use each one to build. So I'd say like, I've been published in this semi-pro magazine. They're like, oh, that's good. Well, we might give you a shot with a pro article. Okay, I do that. And I go like, oh, I've done three pro articles with this magazine and I use that to get into another magazine. They're like, pushing arm for books. And one of my editors who loved me because I was delightful to work with and I would turn in my stuff on time said, uh, hey, do you have any ideas for a book kicking around? And if anyone ever asks you that, the answer is yes. And I said, yes. And uh, so I was so excited. They're like, okay, write a proposal. Let us know what it is. So I started doing that. And then, okay, here comes networking. I had a professor who uh, was a professionally published author in this kind of usually. So offering to take us out to dinner or coffee or whatever, when it's safe to do so, uh, can be really good. Uh, so anyway, my wife and I took him out to dinner, sat down, talking through the whole thing. He goes, do you have an agent? I was like, well, no, I obsessively think about it, but I don't. He's like, you really should get an agent. Uh, and he said, I'll introduce you to some people. Uh, I sent out, I had already tried to get an agent in the past, but this time I sent out, he connected me to three people. I sent out mm, agency like letters, right? Query letters to, I don't know, 15 maybe. And I had three who were really interested and one of whom I didn't want to work with after I spoke to him, uh, who I mentioned earlier. And one of whom is my current agent. Now the book, as I was pitching it then was imaginary Jesus, but it was a nonfiction book of essays that were just kind of funny. Uh, he sent me a note and said, I, I want to, I want to see your proposal. So I sent it to him. And he wrote me back and said, I'm really interested. Uh, send me your chapters. Cause it, I don't think I, he hadn't read my chapters yet. We had set up a phone call to have our conversation. That's what it was. We got on the phone and he said, I didn't love your chapters. And I was like, wait, what are you saying? He's like, yeah, I mean, it's not, do you even like this kind of book? I was like, well, not particularly. Uh, he said, why don't you write something you would like? And I was like, it would be weird. And he said, I'd rather get something weird and interesting than this book. It feels like, Someone's trying to make Sunday school fun and it's not, which was, I was like, oh, that's kind of harsh. I was like, what are you saying? Because I didn't understand. And he was saying, I'm saying I don't want to be your agent at this point. But here's the rejection, right? I don't want to be your agent. But if you write something uh, more along the lines of what you're saying you would like, send it to me. Open door, right? So that's a B for sure. B plus, A minus. Um, so I did. I sent him what became Imaginary Jesus, which you saw earlier. Here it is. Look at the delightful cover. And uh, he loved it, loved it so much. The first six chapters I sent him, he sent me a text that said, don't talk to anyone else. I'm your agent now. And they sent me an email. I said, Matt, I need to speak to you immediately. Please, please uh, don't talk to another agent. And then my phone starts ringing. I look down, it's him. And I get on the phone. He's like, I want to be your agent. I love this book. Ha, ah, everyone's happy. Uh, so happy. So, um, yeah, so great. And then what happens, right? He coaches me through. I write the book because it's fiction. I got to write the whole thing. Uh, he takes it out. We had multiple publishers interested. So different people were targeting, trying to get it. So we had multiple people making offers, which was just delightful. 
so fun. And, I'm, and I met people who are like my lifelong friends uh, because of that. In fact, I think I can tell this. I think this is okay. She's not on the call. The acquisitions editor at my publisher who ended up getting it had broken both of her arms uh, right before we got kind of in conversation. And she loved the book. And she's one of my biggest fans. And she's just a wonderful, delightful person who I deeply love. And uh, yeah, so her arms are broken, both of them. She can't type. She can't text, nothing. Her mom is typing for her or reading her text to her. And uh, Wes, my agent, and I are both like, what happened? How did you, how did you break both of your arms? And she says, this is pretty smart. She says, I'll tell you if you go with our publisher for your book. Otherwise, I'm not going to tell you the story. And we were like, what? No. So we had to go with her, right? We had to know the story, which again, just such good, amazing hook baiting right there. That's what a query letter should be right there. She was saying, you want to know more? Hey, let's get this on the table. Let's do this thing. So that was the beginning. It was a one book deal with an op. I think I had an option to look at the second, which means they want first look. Uh, they invested pretty significantly in me as an author. And uh, we've been great friends ever since. And we've done a bunch of books together and we're doing a bunch more. Um, so let me show you one more thing. You will hear people say you have to pick your lane, right? Fiction or nonfiction uh, or just this kind, like you can only do mystery novels. It's not true. You can write under different names or like I do, right? My first book is this comedy novel thing. I have books that are, so here's this book, The Proposal, which you can see in the comment. The first comment that's pinned there, you can see the nonfiction for people who are trying to talk about, oh, waiting for my connection. It's a nonfiction book for people who are trying to connect with others, talk about their religion in a way that's not offensive. Uh, I've done a memoir, which is surprising, okay. I never thought I'd do a memoir. Uh, this was the one that I mentioned my publisher said we want a different kind of book. It was this one. Uh, Steph, I don't know if you're out there. This book is about a good friend of mine named Steph, uh, who said she might show up today. Uh, who, Steph, you know you can just call me if you have questions. Uh, and then I've done fiction, right? So I've got Crescent Stone, which is a young adult book, young adult fantasy. It's one in a trilogy. So they bought the first two, right? So here's the Heartwood Crown. That's the second. And the third one, The Story King, they didn't buy at the same time. They wanted to see how the first two did. Then they eventually did buy it. So the third one's coming out, ne not this coming summer, but summer 21, which is uh, which is pretty awesome. So for me and my publishers, hey, go go find one of my books that looks of interest to you and, and buy it, give it to a friend, read it on ebook. I know many of us are trapped in our homes right now. Several of these are on audio as well. Uh, and let me say this, Carrie also says, you make the publishing world sound a lot friendlier than I've built up in my head. Here's the deal, it really is. They want you to be successful. And when you are, kindness is met with kindness. Uh, if you are look, it's a business, right? There are these moments. I had a moment with people who I love that I pitched a book to them and they looked at it and they said, we love you. We like this idea. We don't think it's going to make money and we can't buy it from you. And that was, I didn't love that. They didn't love that do books with me, right? We like working together. My, my publisher, Tyndale, I've told him, man, I'd be happy to just do all my books with you. I really enjoy working with them. Uh, they want to be your friends. They want to be involved with you. Some publishers are more professional or meaning more, uh, less family, right? More like done more business, I guess I should say. Totally fine. Uh, you got to find them. Uh, my email and all my social media stuff is in that pinned comment at the bottom of this video, as well as a copy of Asian Out and use the framework for yours, do it. It's a framework that works. I've been using it with all my books going back to forever. Um, if you have a question, give me a shout. If you want another video like this on another topic related to publishing or something else, just let me know. Put a comment here or shoot me a note. Uh, that'll be fine. But all of us in publishing, authors, editors, agents, publishers, we want you to be successful. We want your voice. Uh, and we want to hear from you. So do the work. It's hard work. It is business. Uh, and keep trying. Don't give up. There's a place for you. And we want you to be there. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. And uh, this is a great time.
to be working on your on your uh, professionalism, your writing. Write us something beautiful. We want to hear your voice. Thanks, everyone. I'll talk to you soon. Oh, do I want to end my stream? This happens to me every time. So professional. I'm not a professional streamer. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks.